good evening again to everybody. Um, as Felipe said, uh, I'm part of Biomed uh, the last uh, three years uh, as a postdoc researcher. So today I will give you a brief presentation of the work that we have been doing in Biomed uh, for seizure detection with wearable devices and AI. This is a joint work with the uh, epilepsy group uh, in Biomed, uh, along with uh, some neurologists in UZ Leoven Hospital. Um, so this is the main overview of the uh, presentation that I will give today. I will give you a brief introduction about the uh, problem, what is epilepsy, and then I will um, break, let's say, the presentation in two main parts, feature-based algorithms, uh, uh, which used to be the state of the art for machine learning, um, and how they are being used to detect different types of seizures. I will go uh, in deep learning approaches, and then I will also give you some examples about uh, class scores and data enhancement in order to improve the quality of our labels and our data. And uh, I will finish the presentation with some future possible research questions that we are currently exploring in the field. So, uh, epilepsy uh, is a neurologic, neurological disease uh, that causes episodes of uh, sudden neural activation. So, uh, suddenly some parts of your brain, some neurons, start act being activated and cannot uh, be controlled. Uh, the seizures are being uh, separated in different types. Uh, one of the main categorization of, of the seizures uh, is based on their onset. So uh, the area where uh, the seizure is initiated, uh, if it's in the focal part of, of the brain, if it's a uh, temporal part of the brain or in other parts of the day, or if the uh, onset is generalized, so we have simultaneously activation all over the brain. Furthermore, we uh, classify the seizures based on the symptoms of the patient. So. Um, uh, we can have some seizures where we have a motor onset of the patient, so the uh, patient starts reacting, moving his, his or her, her hands, etc. But we have also uh, what is called absent seizures, where uh, the patients do not have any uh, visual uh, symptoms, so they just freeze and do not react for a couple of seconds. And this is uh, this can be uh, mistaken. Uh, mistakenly not categorized uh, as a seizure by someone that uh, sees um, the patient. So usually uh, the epilepsy diagnosis is being uh, performed in epilepsy monitoring units inside uh, hospitals uh, with full uh, uh, electroencephalography, so with full scalp EEG and video recordings. As you can understand, this is quite time consuming and expensive and uh, is not suitable for long-term monitoring, as you can imagine. Nobody would like to move around with a full uh, hat of EEG and carrying away some um, heavy machinery from the hospital. But the problem is that when we try to um, ask from the patients or the clinical uh, daycare um, personnel that um, take care of them to um, report the seizures, we have seen that 50% more than 50% of the seizures are not reported. So the patients might miss uh, to report a lot of seizures even because they do not realize that they had a seizure or because after a while they forgot. So as mentioned before, uh, we have uh, a big variety uh, of the seizures and every seizure is um, patient specific. So we have different profiles of the seizures that are related to every patient. Uh, there are some general trends, but not all the seizures are the same. So, uh, in order to monitor the patients in the long term, uh, we have started using mobile devices. As you can imagine, uh, mobile devices are not full scalp EEG devices. There are devices placed in different places of the head that I will show you later on. And we have uh, less channels and more artifacts because uh, the patients are moving, uh, sleeping, etc. Uh, generally, there is uh, a lack of reliability uh, on uh, approaches, machine learning approaches that can detect seizures on EEG data. Uh, first of all, because uh, wearable devices are really new uh, in the market uh, and also uh, because we don't have a lot of data available to train uh, very good machine learning approaches. 
Uh, here there's a more uh, uh, specific uh, type categorization of, of, of the features. Uh, and uh, I will give you uh, two examples of two main categories. So the absence scissors example, uh, where we have lack of movement. Um, absence scissors are usually smaller in time. So they start from three seconds to um, 20 to 30 seconds and go a couple of minutes. But as you can see, there are more clear and structured. You can see in all of the channels, we have a structured pattern. So generally they are considered easier to be detected. While if you go to a focal scissor example, uh, you can see here the patient having uh, non scissor and then when you start having the scissor, you can see that the pattern is not the same. Uh, in every channel, we have much more artifacts uh, because the patient is moving. But I would like also to point out, have a look in the ECG, that during the scissor, also the heartbeat of the patient starts starting, start changing. It's not, uh, it's not like the absent scissors that we only have, see this pattern in EEG. So, I gave you those examples, two small examples to understand the diversity and the heterogeneity of the seizure types. Um, one of the uh, attempts to, uh, initial attempts to uh, measure uh, seizures in the home environment um, was with uh, such devices that are like headphones. But nowadays we have moved to smaller patches that can be placed um, in uh, the head of the, uh, the patient. Those devices can measure multiple signals, not only G, uh, but also ECG and EMG. Um, for those that you are not familiar with biomedical terms, uh, ECG is the electrocardiograph that measures the heartbeat and EMG measures the contraction of the muscles uh, of the patient. So with those mobile devices, we can capture uh, different signals that are useful uh, for the use, for the uh, detection of the patient. And what we envision with those uh, mobile devices is to uh, make an automated diary uh, of the seizure. Uh, so to use the different signals, make uh, feature extraction, it can be with handcrafted features or with a neural network, we will see it uh, later. Uh, we create a seizure second classification, we create an offline uh, seizure diary, and then we inform um, the uh, epileptologist, the doctor, about the number of the seizures, the length of the seizures, etc., and he can adapt accordingly uh, the uh, medication of the patient. So it's really important to know how many seizures the patient had, how many, uh, and what was the length of those seizures. Of course, with the input of um, the doctor, uh, the algorithm can be uh, improved. And uh, we also uh, provide a real time, I want to provide a real time alarm so that the patients would know and the relatives would know that the patient is having a seizure currently. So, uh, in order to uh, identify how good uh, the metrics are generally in, in machine learning, probably you're, most of you are, aware, you are aware of those, it's really important to uh, identify some metrics. Um, in seizure detection, uh, we use metrics that are commonly used like sensitivity or specificity, uh, but since the two classes of uh, background noise, background activity and seizure is really, really unbalanced. So uh, you might have one seizure every 24 hours uh, uh, and with, with frequency of 25, uh, 250 hertz, you can imagine that you have lots of samples that are uh, background activity and only a small portion of them being seizure. So uh, a 99.9 .9 accuracy doesn't mean something uh, I mean, we usually use uh, false positive per hour in order to identify how many um, seizures, how many true positives uh, we have. So we use sensitivity, but instead of specificity, we usually uh, use false positives per hour, and I will use them in the following slides to describe the methods. The uh, mobile wearable that we uh, mainly use in the projects uh, comes from the company uh, Bytes Flights. It's called SensorDot, and it's this uh, small device that can be placed in a different uh, uh, positions on the head based on the type of seizure that the patient has. And we have uh, gathered two uh, datasets that will be mainly uh, analyzed. The results of those datasets will be mainly presented in this uh, 
in this presentation, uh, data set number one is called CISIT1 uh, that uh, consists of 42 uh, different patients um, with 120, uh, 182 uh, number uh, of seizures. It's a mainly temporal lobe focal seizures. Um, and then the second data set, which is currently uh, being recorded, it's, uh, let's say, the extension of CISIT1 project is called CISIT2 project. Uh, here we capture also ECG and EMG, and the goal is to record around 500 patients uh, in hospital environment, but also some patients in home environment. And uh, while CZ1 is, was run only in Belgium, uh, CZ2 is uh, run also in uh, England, uh, Germany, Portugal, um, uh, France, um, and the Netherlands. Um, so let's uh, give this general introduction about scissors and types of data, uh, but let us move, let's say, to uh, what you are probably most interested in about um, scissor detection and how we analyze this time series of uh, EEG. So the first study that I will present you is um, a detection of absent scissors. Uh, uh, it's a uh, work that has been published uh, uh, last year. Uh, as you can see, if a patient with absent seizure tries to self-report the seizures by himself, he only gets a sensitivity of 0 0.08, meaning that he lost, he, he cannot uh, report the vast majority of the seizures. And that's the reason, as explained before, because he doesn't have any external um, indications like movement or fading out, etc. So, absent seizures, although that are really are quite easier to be identified by EEG, it's much difficult to be identified by the patients themselves. So, a doctor can identify using a sensor uh, uh, but have a sensitivity of 0 0.83 for a doctor. And you can see here a more detailed representation that uh, patients usually tend to miss more. Uh, the shorter scissors, here you can see the scissors based on seconds, uh, and here uh, groups uh, in scissors 3 to 6 seconds and 7 to 22 seconds. Uh, in both cases, we have a low uh, percentage of self-reported scissors, but especially when the scissor uh, uh, is really small, uh, the patients miss almost all of those scissors. So the first attempt was to create a, a feature, a handcrafted feature selected uh, method. Uh, uh, we trained an SBM model uh, based on different um, features. Uh, the feature set that have been used is uh, both in time domain and in frequency domain. We have used those uh, 13 different uh, uh, features. Um, we computed the features in segment of two uh, seconds with 50% overlap. And we calculated uh, the, the features uh, for all those uh, uh, settings. Uh, yeah, we had a part of training test and um, uh, test set and the validation set. And uh, we have achieved a very, uh, very high uh, performance by sensitivity of 0 0.9967. Um, relatively high uh, false, pos uh, false positives per hour, but if we post processing it, it, uh, it decreases. So someone could say, okay, 98 or 99% of sensitivity, it's almost perfect. You, why do you need to, to, to further study this problem? As mentioned, absent scissors are quite easy. And it's only a big, a small portion of, of the general uh, scissors uh, population. With uh, this uh, algorithm, uh, we managed to uh, reduce the time needed by a doctor uh, from 24 hours per, per, per recording uh, only to uh, a couple of uh, seconds, uh, one, uh, sorry, a couple of minutes, one to uh, 20 minutes. Uh, but now when we move to uh, focal scissors, uh, again, we keep in mind that we only create here algorithms for specific type of scissors. So we only use data from a specific subset of patients and not all the patients together, which will make the problem much more difficult, as we will see, um, as you will see in the following slides. So again, we train the feature-based uh, SBM uh, classifier, and we have two uh, different versions of it: of it, patient-independent uh, and patient-specific, meaning that we train in the first case with uh, one at least one scissor 
uh, from uh, each patient in the patient specific, while in the patient independent, we train the algorithm with all the seizures we have from other patients and not using any uh, seizure from, from, from this patient. You can see the sensitivity is higher, but we have a much higher uh, false uh, alarm rate in the first case, in the dependent case, and the F1 score uh, is better for the patient specific. As you can see, compared to the absence case, we have much, much lower performance. Uh, in the focal uh, scissors because it's a more difficult type of scissors. And pointing out again that we only, again, we only have an algorithm in this case only for focal scissors. But as I uh, gave you the example in, in the beginning, in focal scissors also the ECG changes. The heartbeat rate of the patient uh, increases and we have a change in the heartbeat. So, if you use with an SVM with some handcrafted features only the ECG, you can still get quite acceptable performance with a sensitivity of 65% and force alarm of one hour. The same goes for uh, EMG. So uh, in some of the patients, uh, those that they have tonic clonic seizures, they have a big movement. And if you use the EMG uh, there, you can uh, get high performance, but only on those specific patients that they have tonic clonic seizures. So, we tried to combine all those modalities to see if we can improve the performance. And as you can see, even uh, a simple, in brackets, uh, fusion of the uh, three modalities with a simple or methodology. So we accept that a scissor is a scissor if it is uh, pointed out at least from one of the modalities. So that's what we mentioned, nor fusion. Uh, we get an improvement in the performance compared to the baseline of EG. Uh, it's still under um, under study, let's say, under the debate. If uh, EMG helps in all the patients, it, it can be that it's subset of the patients. The addition of EMG does not improve uh, the overall uh, sensitivity. So uh, the trend now, and mainly most of you uh, would like to hear also about neural networks and uh, are really, really uh, improving the performance in many applications. But currently, this is not the case, at least for a wearable scissor detection. So I give you some example of different uh, types of neural networks that have been used and have been tested uh, with uh, wearable EEGs. I can have. Here you can see the, um, the references. Uh, I will briefly go through, uh, through those uh, methods. You probably know some of them. Uh, so full convolutional um, neural network, uh, um, where the number of filters is, is equals to the number of classes. Uh, 1D convolutional networks have been tested. As both shallow and deep convolution neural networks. Uh, the unit that is um, really important, and we will come back to this, which is um, a type of convolution neural networks that would have two branches, an upward path and a downward path. In the downward path, we extract information on different scales and we use a max pulley, while in the upward path, uh, we, combine, we combine local and global information before giving uh, a prediction. Uh, yeah, the local information is merged via yeah, the attention gate mechanism and also the chrome on it. So there are different uh, approaches, different uh, neural networks that have been tested with our uh, data, with CZ1 data. But as you can see here, and might be of surprise to many of you, the support vector machine still outperforms most of the methods. And why is this happening? Is it, I mean, uh, something really different, neural networks cannot solve it. No, the answer is the lack of data. As you saw, we have only a couple of uh, 40 or 50 patients, and then the uh, neural networks cannot be very well trained uh, on, on, uh, on such a small uh, data set. And um, also, as I mentioned several times, that there are different types of scissors, and we don't have enough data of every type of scissor to train the neural networks. So one and a half year before, uh, there was a challenge uh, that was uh, held uh, by Neurotech X and uh, Temple University of uh, in, in, in the States, uh, which has a huge uh, database, uh, 600 patients, more than 600 patients, more than 3,000 seizures, uh, 6,000 recordings, um, and uh, 
the main difficulty of this data set is that all the patients were merged together. We didn't have any categorization of the type of seizures. So focal seizure, absence seizures, tonic-clonic seizures, all the type of seizures existed in this data set without uh, being able beforehand to know what type of seizure each patient had. So they wanted to have one algorithm, one model that would be used for all the type of seizure, no matter uh, their origin or their onset. And they then in the end of the challenge, they were uh, evaluating the algorithm ba based on this uh, scoring system, uh, which was based on sensitivity and the false set uh, per hour. So uh, the proposal, uh, the work that we have submitted with the biomed uh, irregulars, as I called our uh, groups, was a multi-view fission of potassium-gated units. So we had the PG data that was uh, band fast, and we applied different types of filtering on this data, and then we trained a unit for every uh, pre-processed version of the data, and then we fused uh, the predictions that we had, and we uh, applied some post-processing rules, and uh, we got uh, uh, the seizure labels. So the different types of processing uh, was the much filtered, so we created a library of different filters, like uh, power, inter power line interference, uh, movement, muscular artifact, eye blink, etc. We created filter filters and like classical machine learning um, uh, pre-processing. We uh, tried to make a, a much filtering approach to clean up uh, the, the artifacts. Uh, the second um, um, filtering approach was based in IC label. I don't know uh, how many of you are familiar with ICA. Uh, ICA is a method that tries to uh, decompose the data yeah, into different independent components uh, using different assumptions. And then uh, with IC label, all those components were, uh, were identified either as uh, artifacts or as um, brain signal. Uh, the components of independent components that were identified as um, artifacts were disregarded and we get only the brain signal. So we had those three different used. Uh, we applied on top of it uh, units. I gave a small explanation about what a unit is. And then um, the output of every unit that was considered as another signal, that is another a new time series with probabilities, uh, it was fused with an LSTMM and we provided a fused prediction of those different views of, of the EEG. So we created alternative views of an existing data set. And we applied also some post-processing uh, rules in the end, uh, based on the duration of the event detected, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see here the results of this uh, model. Uh, you can see that the multi-view approach, when you combine the match filter, the IC label, the raw view, outperforms in most of, in most of the thresholds uh, every single view. Uh, both in the TIE score, but also in, in terms of sensitivity. So we have published these um, results in a, in, a, in a paper that also uh, got the best paper award in, in, um, in a conference. But also we won uh, this competition by quite far um, from the second uh, participant. You can see well, biometric regulars. But what I want to stress out is that even the first approach that win uh, one big challenge by far, it still has a very, very low performance. You can see that we have only a sensitivity of 12.3 with false alarm of uh, 1.44, which means that it's a really difficult problem to create an algorithm that fits it all. So we are far from achieving uh, a method, um, a model that can perform equally good in all types of algorithms. So I don't know how much time I have. Um, I will go through quickly two more um, use cases. Uh, so we have, uh, so uh, usually when you apply uh, a machine learning approach, uh, you the probability of every uh, segment that you identify at a seizure, it's not the same. So sometimes you trust more or you trust less your prediction. So we have tried to compute uh, the different trust scores per segment and per uh, prediction, and then give this uh, to uh, 
to the neurologist, the epileptologist. So instead of providing prediction for every uh, part of the signal, we thought that we will provide predictions only on the parts of the signals that we are sure, and then we will flag the parts of the signal that we are not sure, and then uh, the epileptologist will take care only of those. So we will make a classification with a different option, let's say, and this will help the epileptologist of um, reducing the time he or she needs to review the data, but also increase the performance of the model. And uh, uh, if you can see here, this deferral option uh, improves quite uh, significantly uh, the, uh, the current state of the art performance. Uh, of course, it cannot be directly uh, compared since we involve a little bit uh, also the doctors to identify uh, segments that we were not sure. And then as the last uh, use case, uh, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, in the behind the ear uh, uh, EG signals, we have a lower uh, quality. Uh, so the behind the ear data generally is not perfect. It's far from perfect from training models because they're quite noisy. And uh, also some of um, the scissors are not visible. So if we have a scissor starting from the focal and you've placed the um, uh, let's say the sensor dot in behind the ear, it might be that you cannot uh, uh, see this scissor. So usually during the stay of the hospitals and in order to validate and train uh, the models, uh, the neurologist annotate uh, the full scalp EG. But those annotations are usually not 100% correct for the sensor dot, for the wearable EG. So we have proposed an automatically a uh, method that automatically um, uh, automatically tries to classify the annotated segments so it automatically tries to um, see if the annotated segments are correct and uh, as you can see again uh, if you do not accept all the annotations provided by the um, by the neurologist but we try to uh, select those that are um, that are uh, more trustworthy um, uh, improves the, uh, the the total results. Um, this work was just published a couple of one week, just the one uh, week before. Um, we have used again the uh, CISIT one uh, data set for training and the CISIT two uh, data set for 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 testing. Um, uh, generally, it's based on the uh, probability. Uh, probability measures of every uh, of every uh, label, and then giving you some uh, feature uh, research uh, questions, feature research uh, directions that we are currently uh, investigated. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning, the reason that the neural networks are not working is not a miracle or something really different is that a lack of data so we are currently exploring different approaches of transfer learning uh, meaning that we want to train our models uh, with um, data sets of full scalp pg so which are being used for for decades and we have the bigger data sets bigger, bigger available and open source data sets so we would like to train our models in full scalp png and then transfer the knowledge that we have in uh, wearable uh, devices wearable signals and get a new uh, scissor detection some introductory results with uh, a shallow uh, cnl uh, you can see that we can significantly improve uh, your performance if we use the data uh, from bigger data sets to train your model, even if those data sets are not wearable, from, they're, they're not from wearable devices, but are from uh, full uh, EG. Uh, furthermore, we would we explore uh, ways of uh, improving the multimodal scissor detection. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning, uh, we have seen that with uh, naive in brackets uh, fusion with just an or. Uh, the classifier, the multimodal classifier, can perform um, the the overall uh, detection, prediction detection. We also saw during the Ruka challenge that even a multi-view approach can improve uh, can improve the detection, meaning that we have information lying uh, both 
in all the modalities, but also in alternative views of the same modality like EEG. So we have explored uh, LSTM as a fusion approach, we have explored uh, early fusion, but there are other more sophisticated uh, ways like multimodal transformers that can uh, be used to fuse those uh, different uh, signals and those different modalities. And there are currently uh, being uh, explored by uh, our group. And I think uh, moving on the last or in the penultimate uh, um, use cases, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the artifacts and the artifact detection is really important to uh, to improve the performance of the algorithms. So we can detect, let's say, parts of the data that are considered as anomaly. So outliers, artifacts can be. Um, can be considered as such and then uh, or even uh, labeled, uh, labeled um, labels that are not following let's say the general rules and by incorporating incorporating this anomaly detection in your um, models in your algorithms you can uh, at least in theory improve your performance and this is something else that we are currently uh, exploring exploring and then we also want to build more on this uh, semi-supervised uh, approach, uh, the approach with the deferral option that I mentioned before, and um, try to uh, ask feedback from the neurologist when our model is not sure, and then use this feedback to retrain our model. When a model is not sure, it means that it doesn't have adequate information to provide uh, the uh, exact results, the accurate results. So we are. Uh, investing time into um, improving this deferral option or semi-supervised uh, learning that will be personalized for every patient. So for every patient who will receive some um, input from the doctor, from the neurologist and optimize uh, the multimodal model um, to provide the best prediction. Uh, here just to mention also that the deferral option uh, publication that we have was not with a multimodal model, was only with uh, EEG. So this is another uh, extension of it. So to add this semi-supervised deferral mode also in a multimodal uh, um, model. And of course, this is what we envision um, uh, in the end uh, to have either in the hospital or in uh, um, in the home environment, um, some very accurate detection uh, algorithms that can be uh, used both ways. So to train the uh, wearable devices with a multimodal classifier uh, uh, from data obtained during the stay in the hospital, uh, optimize it, and then with type of transfer learning, uh, create and a model for the wearable device that can be used even online. So to make some anomaly detection and inform uh, the patient that uh, he or she uh, is having uh, uh, seizure and of course make uh, seizure diary uh, for the doctor. So I think I tried to be on time. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for your uh, time. And if you have any questions, I will be glad to, to to answer.